Good morning from Fort Worth, Texas, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday morning of the Southwest Believers Convention 2017. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do to help us at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And I wanna thank you for being a part of this meeting so far this week. We've had a huge response uh, on the network and online, and we know that so many of you are out there watching, and we are so glad that you are. Now, if you missed any of yesterday, I don't know how you could have, but sometimes life gets busy uh, when you're not actually here in the building and you miss things. We wanna take you back to yesterday and show you some of the, I, I say highlights, some of the huge highlights from yesterday. Watch this. God for a need. Look at me. And I never will. Why? Because he supplies how many? How many? How many? So I don't tell him what I need. I tell him what I want. But you knew God wanted you to be here and you determined nothing's going to stop me. And I believe God will honor that. Praise God. And many of you are going to return home and find out it's all been taken care of. Hallelujah. For us, it's a time each year that we can come and get, it, and as, as they say, totally immersed in the Word. When you leave out of here, you're going to be calling things that be not as though they were. You're going to be decreeing a thing, and it's going to happen just like that. I don't have to get my healing, Mr. Devil. Jesus got it for me 2,000 years ago, and I received it. Hallelujah. Ha, ha. <laughs> the atmosphere is miraculous, to say the least. You are not righteous because of what you have done. You are righteous because of what Jesus has done. You are not redeemed because of what you do. You are redeemed because of what he has done. It is in him we move, in him we breathe, in him we have our being. Everything I am, I am because of Jesus. This is where you need to be. If you really love God, if you really want to draw closer to God, if you really want to understand the importance of the foundational principles of faith and how faith causes us to move into the impossibilities in the realm of the spirit, then this is where you need to be. My goodness gracious. Uh, you know, the only way to describe what has been happening here this week is just uh, glorious. Glorious is a great way to describe what's going on in this building this week. And if you are in the local area, you still have time to get down here. I know it's Wednesday, but you still have time to get here and we would love to have you come be with us this week. Now, as has been the case all this week, uh, I've had the pleasure of, of my good friend, Greg Stevens being with me this week and giving you reports uh, from in and around the convention center. You know, sometimes on these shows, they play this game called where in the world is so-and-so. We're gonna play a little game today called where in Fort Worth is Greg Stevens? Let's go to Greg and find out where he is. Greg? Tim, I'm about two blocks from where you are, right that way in the convention center, and I'm standing in the middle of an urban Fort Worth, Texas. This is Sundance Square. Many of the convention goers will come here and have lunch and, and take a break and do some shopping. You can see some of the architecture behind me. The, the courthouse building is right down the street from me right here. And this is where a lot of the, uh, you know, in between times happen here at the Southwest Believers Convention. I wanted to show you what started out as a small cow town on the banks of the Trinity River has turned into a major metropolitan area. Bass Hall Performing Arts Center is right over here. I encourage you, you want to come to Fort Worth and check all of this out. Now, next time we come outside, I'm going to take you back in time. So back to you, Tim, in the convention center. All right, thank you, Greg. You know, some guys just get to have all the fun. Greg, Greg Stevens is having so much fun, uh, and it's great to have him with me this week. And we're going to hear from him again before this program is over today, so don't go anywhere. You know, last night, 
if you were watching on Facebook, you turned on Facebook and you say, wait a minute, that's not Kenneth Copeland, that's not Creflo Dollar. Last night on Facebook, we had our cameras over uh, in the 1440 service with uh, a, a powerful man of God, uh, Todd White. And Todd was gracious enough to join me this morning. Good morning. And I, I know that last night, you told me a minute ago, it was just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You talk a lot about, and you talked about it last night, about just selling out to Jesus. That's right, man. And that's something you had to do in your own life. That's uh, right. So you're not preaching something that you haven't done. No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's it, Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything less than to give him everything that we are. Yeah, you uh, you know, last year you were here for the first time. Yeah, uh, got a chance to be around Brother Copeland, uh, and I know Brother Copeland has had a pretty profound impact on your life. Talk about that a little bit. I just, you know, I got I got saved 14 years ago. Came out of 22 years of addiction, drugs, atheism, anger, hatred, and when I got born again, I I got saved by getting shot at, I actually got shot at in a drug deal from 10 feet away, ripped the dealer off, unloaded a nine millimeter at me. And at this point in my life, I heard this voice say, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? I had no idea what that even meant. I thought I got shot. I thought I was dying. I thought I was going to meet whoever's next. And I had met a pastor five and a half months earlier who told me about Jesus, about surrendering my life. And I didn't know what that meant, you know? And so I, I wanted to, but I had no idea. So the night I got shot at, I come home and there's no bullet holes in my car from 10 feet away. I go up to the door, my girlfriend and my daughter are in there. I had trashed and destroyed their lives. Uh, I left, I went away to a place called Teen Challenge. I had a radical encounter with Jesus when I was in Teen Challenge. And when I came home two months later, 10 months early, my girlfriend, that I, when I went away, she had given her life to Christ when I went away. And my daughter, my seven and a half year old daughter, I realized I was a daddy for the first time in my life. And we got married four days later, and it was amazing. It was a brand new creation reality. And I actually uh, turned on the TV, because I now I want to know, what is this all about? And uh, Brother Copeland was on there, and I just heard him talk about faith, and I just heard him talk about who Jesus was to him. And I was so blown away, and I couldn't get over his eyes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, he's got these amazing eyes that glare right into your soul, man. And I, I was like, gosh, what is that? You know, and it's the lamp of the body. Because yeah. if your eye is single, your whole body's full of light. And I could see it. And so I'd watch him, I'd watch him on his fishing show, just sitting there out by the lake. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so it's, it ha has had a profound impact. The, just the, the whole word of faith, just believing the word and going after the word and going after the, the truth of what the word says yeah. and having faith to move mountains. And, I'm just blown away and it's had such an impact on my life. I, yeah. so I got to see him last night and thank him again. Just <laughs> thanks for what you've done. And Yeah, that was a real special moment. Oh, I, I, I was privileged to be back there. It really is special to yeah. me. Uh, you know, Todd, you know, these days you know, with social media and, and the news, you, you cannot turn the news on any day of the week or watch social media without seeing something about somebody, you know, taking their own life or overdosing on, on uh, drugs. How do we reach those people? How do you? How do we get to those people and help them understand that there's something better than that? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, to, there's a lot of people that have family members that are addicted. They're a family member that's addicted, and they're like, "Well, God, you know, when when it's time, God will get them or whatever." And they kind of, but a lot of times, because of the hurt, because of the pain, because of the theft, because of the stealing, all the stuff that comes with addiction, we cut that person off and we say, "Well, when they're ready, they'll surrender." And what we actually do, I, I believe, is we, sometimes we put this thing so much into the free will of the person and we say, well, they'll have to choose, they have to make a choice. I personally believe that I can make a choice for people. See, if my war is not against flesh and blood and it's not against them, but it's against principalities, demonic strongholds and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, that means that the person that's addicted is not my problem. The things that are possessing them is my problem. So what if, that person that has no idea who Jesus is, the reason why they don't is because they're completely addicted, they're blind, they can't see, they don't know who they are. But if I'm a believer that can see, and God says that anything I ask according to His will, He'll give it to me. He says that anything I ask in prayer, believing that I've received it, I'll receive it. He says that God's desire is that none perish, but that all be saved and come to the knowledge of Him. Yeah. If that's what God's Word says, and I'm a believer that's empowered with truth, and I serve the King of glory, mm -hmm. then I can actually claim somebody that doesn't believe, and there's no way for them to get out of it. And I've watched so many people, drug addicts, alcoholics, all that stuff. And, and to top it off, you have these people that sometimes we think, like for instance, we 
I'm just gonna give you a scenario. We adopted a little boy last year in June of last year. Now this little boy was born to a mom that was a heroin addict. Now she was a heroin addict for 20 years. She came into a church that I frequent down in, in Huntington, West Virginia. And she came in there and said, I have, I'm pregnant and I don't want this baby. Now she's been shooting up for six months of the baby's life inside of her belly already. Now you can't tell that woman that she needs to stop what she's doing because she needs to learn a better way that you need to stop right now. You don't realize what you're doing. Yeah. See, the problem is that she's blind and she can't see. Yeah. Like if I were to walk up to a blind person and, and, and they had their stick out there, a red tip at the end of the stick, it would be totally inhumane for me to go up to them and say, how many fingers do I have up and get angry at them? Say, listen to me. Don't you hear what I'm saying? How many fingers? Oh, well, how about now? How about now? Yeah. How about now? Right. That would be ignorant unless we pray for a miracle to happen and a miracle does happen. So for me to get mad at that blind person is just the same as for me to get ma mad at a mother that's been shooting heroin. Oh, that has good. a kid, she has no idea who she is. Oh. So our little son was born on Father's Day of last year and we're there and he came out of mom's belly and they brought him right into the other room where my wife and I were there. And they, they cut that cord that right there in the other room. They brought him over here, washed him up and handed him to us. And I sat there with my son and I just cried and cried and thank God because the spirit of adoption is, should be upon the whole church actually. Adoption should be a big deal to the church. Yeah. It says care for orphans and widows, keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. And so we have this boy and then 24 hours later, I have to go out to a meeting in, in Norway. But my son has just been born. He's 24 hours old. He starts to manifest addiction. He starts to manifest the reality of him being addicted to heroin starts to tremble, starts to shake, his whole body just starts to go into convulsions because that's what happens with an addicted child. And so when I get back from this school that we did, a power and love school that we do, these identity training schools, we came back, lots of people were empowered to go out there and witness in public and be amazing examples of light and darkness. I come back and my son is in rehab. So I go up into the hospital, they let me in the unit, I put my gown on, I scrub up all my, all my hands, I walk into my room and there's my boy, shaking and manifesting addiction. There's another lady that's in there that's shaking and, and, and just trembling because she's on methadone. She's actually addicted to methadone. This is her second baby that's born. So you have nurses in the hospital that are completely frustrated because they're in this unit. There's 18 babies in there, all of them screaming and crying. And these ladies hold these babies and try, and try to give them comfort. Yeah. But it's really hard to comfort a child that's addicted. Yeah. And so now I'm in there and the nurse looks at me and she goes, I said, hey, I gotta tell you how much Jesus loves you. And the nurse goes, oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm not religious. And she walks out of the room. I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I'm not religious either. I love Jesus with all my heart. Yeah. She goes, yeah, okay. She walked out. She thinks that I'm the parent of the baby and I'm the reason why and he's addicted. Yes. And so okay. she comes back in and I said, hey, I said, you have problems with your ankles, don't you? She goes, well, it comes with the territory. I said, well, how about this? Let me pray for you. She goes, no, I'm busy. She walks out, I chase her down the hallway. I pray for her and God gives her brand new ankles. This nurse gets overwhelmed with Jesus. She right. comes back into the room. She's still frustrated because I'm an addict. Now yeah. I'm gonna pray in Jesus' name. And then I tell her how we're adopting the baby and she totally chills out. And then this lady that's in our room with us, the other mama, the other baby, she starts crying because she's condemned because she's beat up. See, they have these, these heroin addicts yeah. that get completely free from heroin and they say they're free from heroin, but they hook them on methadone. And now you have moms and dads that are hooked on methadone all across the world. And these methadone clinics are, are created. Methadone was never designed to get people off of heroin. Yeah. Methadone was designed to keep people hooked forever. Oh, and so good. it's harder that's to good. break than heroin. That's good. So now you have moms and you have yeah. dads that are hooked on methadone. They yeah. really don't want to be anymore, yeah. but they can't get free. And a doctor won't wean them down to get off. Ooh. And so now I'm in this hospital with all these people praying, going from room to room. We're not supposed to go to room to room, but I can't help it. I'm like, look, you have value. You have purpose. Yeah. You don't understand what Jesus thinks about you. You're not the product of your life. Yeah. And you are not the identity of who your parents created you to be. Whew. Because God says that you have the DNA of Abba. Yes. You see it, it's the divine right. nature of Abba, Amen. the DNA. That is that so God good. wants to be your dad, he yes. wants to be your father. Absolutely, And That's the people so in there, we're kind of overwhelmed. Yeah. I get in on the elevator with one of them, a, d a dad and a mom, and they're looking down at the ground, and I got my gown on, you know, I'm just going downstairs, <laughs> and hey man, how you guys doing? Jesus loves you. And, yeah, yeah. I get it. thanks a lot. I said, no, I don't think you hear me, man. Jesus loves you. Well, man, that's crazy. That's, uh, that's a little too much for me. No, 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 it's not too much, man. You have to understand, I share my testimony of 22 years of addiction, 22 years of atheism and anger, how I hated Christians because they were hypocrites that's and all right. they did was yeah. this. 
Jesus rocked me to the core. So that day he asked me, he said, he said, so how, how do you know this Jesus? I said, man, I said, he's amazing. He goes, well, we're walking back to our hotel. It's a mile away. I said, wait a minute. I said, why don't we give you a ride? He said, well, we can walk. I said, no, you can't. We're driving the same way. So I, I want to help him. So he goes to get in the car. And I said, wait, before you get in the car, I said, you have pain right between your shoulder blades and your wife has pain in your neck. And I said, and I know that God wants to touch you. He goes, man, I'm not getting in the car with you, man. You're scaring me. I said, scaring you? I said, I love Jesus. He goes, well, how? You can't know about my back and you can't know about my wife's neck. You're kind of freaking me out. I said, well, just give me your hand. So I prayed for him, prayed for his wife, both of them get healed. So we get in the car and the guy's in the back seat. He goes, I am overwhelmed by what you're doing. right. I don't even understand what's happening. So I shared the gospel with him. I shared the cross. Wow. We get to the hotel a mile away. Now these people are addicted to heroin. They're not on methadone. Yeah. They're literally addicted and they're right in the midst of their addiction. And people look at them as trash and they look at them as just a waste of life, not a waste of life. They have great value to the Father. And sometimes because we're blind, as a church sometimes, we can't see these that's people. True. That's right. We don't understand who they are. Yeah. They have value. Yeah. Jesus yeah. would say, hey, come on, let's yeah. go. Yes, he would. He, he did was that. a friend of He did that all the time. That's right. He did that all the time. That's right, man. Yeah, he did that all the, the time. The guy looks at me in the back seat. He goes, he goes, do you think Jesus would do that for me? And I start crying. I said, man, God. God would love to do it for you, man. We pull over to the hotel. He gets out. He goes, what do I do? I said, you just say yes, man, it's a free gift. No, no, no. What do I have to do to, to, to do this? I said, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is believe, man. He goes, believe, just that's easy. I said, that's it. He goes, I want Jesus, man. And him and his wife got born again and the Holy Spirit just went wham and landed on these people. It's so powerful, man. How do you reach them? How do you reach them? You deny yourself. Yeah. You, you actually pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Yes. You become love yeah. what the gospel says you are. You stop holding on to you and stop holding on to your hurts, your junk, yeah. all that twisted stuff. You believe the gospel and you believe that with God all things are possible. That's right. And you touch people in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. and God sets them free, man. And that right there, some of you needed to hear what we just talked about. Todd right there just gave you about a three or four or five minute sermon on how to, how to be saved. Just do it. Give yourself to Him. Give Him that addiction. Give Him whatever it is that, that you have in your life that is above Him. Because there should be nothing in your life above Jesus. That's right. And Jesus will take whatever is in your life that is holding you back and, and let Him have it. He can handle it. <laughs> he can right. handle it. He's done it millions and millions of times. And that right there is the answer. So take that. Just ask Him into your life. Man, that is so powerful. Gosh, Todd's almost got me crying out here. <laughs> Uh, you know, let's find out where Greg is. Greg's somewhere else in Fort Worth. Greg, where are you? Tim, I told you the next time you see me, I would go back in time, and that's exactly what I've done. I'm in front of the world-famous Fort Worth Stockyards. Fort Worth, Texas was right on the cattle trail that went from here all the way through Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, up into Kansas and fed a growing nation. And the cowboys came through here in the late 1800s. They processed the, the meat down there, right there at the Armour Swift plant up until the 1970s. There's still a rodeo that happens here every Friday night. You can get boots handmade for you on the corner, saddles, hats, all of it. If you want a cowboy up, Stockyards in Fort Worth, Texas is the place to be. They, offer, they also walk the Longhorn cattle right down Main Street. Matter of fact, Tim, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to pitch it to you now back at the convention center. And then when I get down the street here, I want you to come right back to me. I got something very special I want to show you. Back to you, Tim. I, Greg, how do you get from one place to another so quickly? I don't know how that happens, but it's, it's called fast cars, I guess. Uh, I'm pleased now to be joined by someone who uh, who has been called into uh, civil service, you know, working in government, being involved in government, uh, which is a calling all of us have, by the way, but just unfortunately so very few answer the call. Uh, we are all supposed to be involved in our civil government here in the United States and really even around the world. You may live in a, in a, in a country where maybe you don't have a voice, but you have a, you have a prayer closet and you can pray. Uh, but I have with me now Camille Solberg, uh, who is done a lot of stuff uh, uh, with civil government and has a lot of contacts and a lot of favor with people in government. Uh, tell us quickly what you're involved in and, and, and how you got involved. 
Um, right now, um, I work for the chairman of Homeland Security in the U.S. Senate. Um, I, I have the distinct honor of representing for him the people of Wisconsin. Um, I'm not only his Hispanic um, representative, community liaison, but I'm also his regional director for the east central part of the state. Um, I'm also a White House Hispanic liaison currently. So within a couple of hours, I have to be on a White House call um, that will be, the, the briefing call is usually a group of people from around the nation. We're between 10 to 15 individuals that are giving an update on um, what the president's agenda is this week and next week. Yeah. A lot of people, if you watch the news, which I don't recommend actually to do that very often, if you watch the news and you follow social media, there, there's this perception that there's just there's chaos in the White House and they don't know what they're doing up there. Is that true? It's not true. And, and this is why I go to the horse's mouth to get the information, which is straight to the White House appointees and those that are part of the administration. Once I gather that information, like what I'm going to get today, I spread it with other you know, like-minded individuals and people that work with me so that we can all be in unity because it can bring a lot of confusion when we're hearing the media say one thing and the White House is acting, obviously, another, the administration. So it's really interesting how um, this particular time is uh, moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had an opportunity back in November as a body of Christ. I think we got a second chance. We got our country back in right. so many ways. And I know that's something that you had prayed for uh, and been a part of for so many years. Uh, and we've got legislation that is working through, working its way through Washington, but it's not gonna happen unless people get involved. Talk about how people need to get off of their couches or their chairs and get involved in this thing. It's all about trust and building trust with your local leadership. Yeah. Um, when I started, I was very involved with my grassroots, the Republican Party of Wisconsin, the grassroots, the simplicity of that, connecting with people. Reince Priebus, who was the chairman of the RNC, who was the chief of staff of the president, he was just another volunteer like I was 20 years ago. Right. I mean, you know, for us, he was just Ryan's, or for Paul Ryan, he was just Paul, yeah. you know, or, or Scott Walker, he was just Scott. So um, once you get into that inner circle and you start showing that you're loyal and you're trustworthy, they start putting you in positions of power. Right. And especially as a minority, what I brought to the table is we as Hispanics, we as minorities, we do want a piece of this pie. We want our voices to be heard. So my passion was to bring what I had into the party and obviously our elected officials because I wanted them to understand these communities. So that gave me that open door. But I encourage people to start in that, you know, in the local and little by little, you'll get into the executive board of the party, et cetera. Um, I also encourage young adults to intern, uh, you know, in Senate office, in congressional office, in senatorial office, in assembly offices, et cetera. You get your foot there, but you have to be a very strong person and you have to understand the power that God's giving you and your tools. This is not easy. No. It's not easy to be a born again believer, spirit filled. It's not easy. You yeah. don't know the challenges that I face, but I know my tools and I know how to go right over that yeah. and conquer. And you know your God. And I, I know my God. <laughs> I know what he can do. Yeah. And I know, for example, when people come and protest outside our door, I just, in my mind, I just pray them out. And within three, four minutes, they're out. They're yeah. not here anymore. Yes. It's the power that we can bring. It's it's our Garden of Eden within these federal offices. Yeah, I think the thing that we need to stress this morning is that we have a White House that is receptive to the issues that we all feel so strongly about. They're receptive to the things that we as believers are, are our, our core values. Right. We, have a, we have a vice president who, you know, has been an evangelical Christian for years and years and years. And we have a president who is, has a heart for God. Now he, right. does he do everything right? No. Right. But I, I really believe, and I think you've probably seen this, he really has a heart to do what's right. 
it's so special to be in this time, in this, you know, in this particular configura configuration. For example, in Wisconsin, we have the governorship, the assembly, the Senate, um, the attorney general's office. We have one of, of, one of the U.S. senators, and they're all believers. And generally, the majority are born-again Christian. When I started in 1990 in Wisconsin, it was completely... I'm going to call it blue. Sure. I mean, Good. for the exception of Tommy Thompson, everything. Yeah. The whole, the whole, um, you know, state has turned around 100%. And now we have a born-again Christian as a governor. So these are people that I can text and say, I don't recommend this or this is happening, you know. And because we build that relationship from 20 years ago, I have complete access to them because there's a level of loyalty and trust and people yeah. in government never, ever, ever forget that. Yeah. They never forget that. And that's how I operate within the, the Isles of Power. How can people pray for you? Oh my goodness, I just, just wisdom. Because to be frank, I, I live one day at a time. I'm just, every day is a new beginning for me. Every day is a new surprise. Every day God, you know, is leading me to something new. I definitely do prepare myself spiritually. I mean, seriously, I remember Sister Copeland um, saying years ago that she would pray one hour in, in the spirit yeah. for her son. Well, I took that and I've taken that for like ever. And I, that's one of my, you know, main um, disciplines. Yeah. So there's certain things that I've learned and the Lord has showed me that I have to have and to be ready for the next day in this in this arena. Let me encourage those of you watching, please uh, pray for Camille and people like her that are on the front lines uh, of our government. Uh, you know, Camille is in a really strategic place uh, and there are other people like her uh, and it should encourage you. As believers, it should encourage you that there are people in those positions. And if we continue to pray, and don't take our hands off the wheel, we gotta continue to keep our hands on the wheel. I know you guys get tired of hearing me say that, but we have to stay involved and we have to stay engaged. And, and the way to do that is pray for people like that and to be involved, call your representatives and know what's going on in our nation. Well, the last time we left Greg, he was down in one of the, my most favorite places, the stockyards. Let's go down to Greg Stevens now and find out where he is. Greg, what you got for us? Okay, Tim, I was down the street a minute ago and then I ran into Big Jake here. That's a real Texas Longhorn. His horns are about six and a half feet wide. And I do not want to be on the business end of this guy. So I might be a little bit late getting back to the next session, uh, but because I think I'm going to ride Big Jake back. Let's see if that works. All right, I'm going to go. Here we go. All right, Tim, back to you. We'll see you in a minute. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, I hope Greg makes it back. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe it will, on, on that ride, it may take him a little while to get back here, but I know Greg's on his way back and hopefully, hopefully Jake will treat him well. And Greg Stevens, I don't know. I, sometimes I, I have to pray for that boy. <laughs> uh, we're gonna get you into the service uh, here in just a moment, Pastor Terry's pre-service prayer. Uh, and uh, I know you've enjoyed that so far. You know, prayer, as I've said last night, I think on my clothes, that prayer is the foundation of everything here at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. You know, every successful Christian endeavor begins with prayer. And so that's, that's a really key. And so that's why we have these pre-service prayer services is to, to start this service off right, get into prayer and, and usher in the Holy Spirit. And then the praise and worship team will be on the platform uh, at the top of the hour. And then this morning, I believe we have Jerry Savelle and then Brother Copeland will be our speakers this morning. So you want to make sure you stay with us all this morning. Uh, if you're watching us uh, on Facebook, hello to all of you. Thanks for being with us. If you're watching us on the network, God bless you. I know there's so many more people watching all the time and the network continues to grow and we're continuing to do things for the network. So stay with us and believe God with us for this network because we're going to make things much, much better for you. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in a little while. Enjoy pre-service prayer and enjoy the morning service.